investment and the IPO, the time, the, 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 the period is very, very short, uh, only uh, 36 uh, months, right? So most of these uh, private uh, placement investors are focused on very, very late, uh, late stage uh, companies. If you look at the United States, uh, for example, United States uh, early stage uh, financing is really early, you know, 10 years before IPO, uh, 12 years before uh, IPO. Uh, if you look at Microsoft and Oracle, for example, the uh, venture capital uh, fund was invested 10 years before these companies went uh, IPO, whereas now in China it's 36 months, right? The cycle is much shorter. Uh, this is uh, uh, data from the U.S., uh, uh, from, a, uh, from research project on the U.S. Uh, venture capital investments. And basically, it tells you the same thing. The, the number of the month uh, pre-IPO, uh, before IPO, and between the uh, uh, venture capital investments and the IPO is very, very long in the United States as compared with China. Um, the other problem is that the venture capital industry in China uh, less so in India, but, but it's, it's also a problem in India, is dominated by foreign players, uh, mostly dollar funds rather than RMB funds. And even some of the RMB funds are now run mostly by foreign investors, not by domestic investors. One problem with foreign dominance of the VC and, and PE industry is that they tend to focus on large projects. Right? So, if you are buying capital and you have an operation in China, right, it, the fixed costs of operating the, the Beijing office, the Shanghai office, are very, very high. So for you, it's really not worth the effort and the time and the money for you to look at all these small projects. What you want to do is to do one or two big projects rather than uh, many, many small projects. I just came back from a... Uh, from a um, uh, innovation Summit in New Orleans, uh, where uh, a number of venture capitalists from Silicon Valley uh, gave their views of the venture capital industry in the United States. You know, there, you know, people like Kostler, these are very, very prominent uh, venture capital uh, investors. They invest in small projects uh, around the Silicon Valley uh, area. Uh, they invest in many, many small uh, projects, and one of them and two of them will succeed. So when you don't have the domestic investors close to where the companies are, typically you have this problem. There's a bias in favor of uh, large uh, companies. And usually, uh, as we know, that it is the small companies that are more innovative. It is the small companies that have a higher probability of coming up with truly new technology, truly new uh, innovation. Uh, in China, the average size of the early stage investment uh, is $5 million. This is a, this is a huge amount uh, uh, in terms of the size of the investment. In India, it's also, uh, 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 the, the money is also very large. And, you know, typically the early stage, for example, in the United States, it can be less than $1 million, right? So if, if in China it's $5 million, you really have to have some revenue, you really have have some growth before you hit that uh, threshold. Uh, this is uh, data on, again, on this uh, bias in favor of the large companies. Universities, uh, that's another mechanism to foster uh, entrepreneurship. And I'm very happy to learn that CEN has alliances with Chinese uh, universities. Uh, from our own research, and we have PhD students working on this uh, topic, from our own research, uh, it is clear that Chinese universities are more aggressive in incubating uh, uh, these uh, early stage uh, entrepreneurial uh, projects. But if you study the number of the late stage private equity and venture capital investments uh, in those ventures started by the universities, right? as a measure of how successful the university sponsorship has been, the record is not terribly encouraging. That is to say the university sponsored projects, not many of them have grown to a sufficient 
size or maturity to attract late stage uh, financing. Right? Most of the late stage financing uh, in China is actually unrelated to projects uh, with uh, Chinese university. So Tsinghua University and Indian Institute of uh, Technology, these are excellent uh, universities in terms of training their students. Uh, but I'm not sure that they have played the same role as MIT in Boston or Stanford uh, in Silicon Valley in terms of creating the next wave of uh, entrepreneurial and technological companies. Uh, they may have provided to the Chinese society, Indian society, high level of human capital, but in terms of providing uh, entrepreneurial projects, I, I think they have, they have a long way to go to catch up with uh, MIT and Stanford. There's a study of uh, MIT's um, uh, uh, sponsorship uh, related uh, companies uh, uh, in the last uh, 20 years, uh, companies uh, directly sponsored by MIT, companies uh, funded by MIT faculty, companies uh, funded by uh, MIT students uh, in the last 20 years. If you add up all these uh, companies together, in 2000, I think the data uh, refers to 2006. Uh, in 2006, these companies generate sales uh, uh, revenue equal to the GDP of South Korea. Right? So it, it's just it, it, it's unbelievable, uh, unbelievable that uh, uh, the role of one university in the United States in terms of directly contributing to company formations and entrepreneurial development is so substantial, right? I don't think Tsinghua and the uh, Indian Institute of Technology have uh, reached that stage, although they are probably developing in that direction. Um, the other uh, way to foster innovation is through uh, foreign direct investment. And there, you know, some of you may be familiar with some of the, the things that uh, multinational corporations have done in China. Let me give you one example of uh, Google Right. Google decided earlier this year to uh, terminate its uh, search engine business in China. But it has not stopped its uh, R&D operation in China. Right. So clearly, multinational corporations are looking toward the high level of human capital in China to undertake R&D activities, even though uh, some of them have decided to leave the Chinese market, but they focus on the supply side of, uh, of uh, uh, the human capital's uh, supply of, uh, in China. Um, Microsoft uh, now, uh, its operation in China has the second largest number of patents, uh, as, uh, only, second only to its operations in the United States. Um, in India, uh, GE India, uh, uh, it's a very R&D focused uh, operation. It has the largest uh, uh, R&D center outside of the United States with uh, 3,500 uh, uh, researchers. What's also interesting about GE India is that they have developed a number of technologies specifically catering to Indian economy, Indian business, and Indian society. So this is not just taking one piece of uh, existing technology from the United States and adapt the technology in India, they actually have come up with India-specific technologies. But the problem with the FDI approach is they tend to lock up the human capital. Right? So they are existing companies, large companies, and they don't really, uh, although you can argue there's some spillover effect to the Chinese uh, uh, entrepreneurs, uh, but I think the main motivation on the part of the multinational corporations is to lock up the human capital within, uh, within them rather than, uh, rather than creating new companies and new entrepreneurial projects. So let me talk about the two, uh, I want to leave some time for Q&A, so let me, let me go through this part of the presentation quickly uh, to talk about the two two paths of uh, entrepreneurial development in China and India. One is the demand driven, and this has to do with user innovations uh, and market uh, driven uh, commercialization. The other is a supply driven uh, dynamic, mostly by the government, right? R&D funding 
uh, is clearly one of 